So, here we go. So this is John Arthur Aykroyd. And, oh, let me make sure that this is, yeah. Okay. He was born on October 3rd, 1949 in Sweet Home, Oregon. He grew up with a father who was a maintenance worker and a mother who was an office worker for the police department. And he was also the middle child and with an older and younger sister. It's always the middle children, isn't it? <laughs> Got some great Yorkshire phrases for you after SS. Oh, well, I am going to end my stream after Sinister Sunday, but I would be happy to hear them on Tuesday or Thursday. I will be streaming on those days as well. Um, okay, so growing up, he was often seen as a loner, was often bullied. Um, while attending high school, he was even seen as a special education student, which was indicated on his high school diploma. And sometime after high school, he was accused of felony theft. All right, Team Blue, it's time to find out which celebrity he resembles. Ooh. Hmm. You guys are going to have to help me out with that one because I, I can't see anybody personally. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. We'll keep that in mind and we'll keep going. But yeah, I wonder. So after that felony theft accusation, he enlisted in the army and he uh, worked as a mechanic overseas during that time. He was caught stealing some of the equipment and was discharged and came back to the U.S. So in 1977, when he got, came back into the U.S., he began working for the state highway department along U.S. Route 20 in Oregon. Uh, he would clear wrecks that occurred along the highway and assist those whose car broke down along the highway. And he worked there for several, several years, I think even decades. So he got to know that route and that highway very, very well and the surrounding woods as well. Looks like Sal from Impractical Jokers. Oh, I never saw Impractical Jokers, but I believe you. I don't know why it's not always showing my messages. That's weird. Uh, Sam from Game of Thrones. I could see that. Yes. Good one, devil. Love Child of Sal and Sam. Yeah, I could totally see that. Okay, so that's just kind of a little bit of background on Ackroyd. And honestly, we're just going to get right into the awful stuff because we have a lot to talk about today. So... This is Marlene Gabrielson, and before we talk about her story, I just want to say that if you are triggered by stories of rape or anything like that, uh, might want to tune out of the stream because that's what we're going to be talking about for a little bit here, and I'm going to put a trigger warning on the stream for you guys. Where is he from again? Um, he is from Sweet Home, Oregon. Okay, welcome back, Prometheus. So, so yeah, just proceed with caution from here on out. So in, 1990, in 1977, excuse me, Ackroyd raped a woman named Marlene Gabrielson, and she was 20 at the time, um, and this was off of Highway 20. So this is a really sad story, but it was her first night out since she had had her baby, and she had a friend uh, look out for her baby while her and her husband went to the sister's rodeo together. It was kind of like their their first night out since having the baby. So they were really excited um, to go and kind of party with some friends. And again, she's 20 years old who just had the newborn baby. So she's like, yeah, I do want to go out and hang out with some friends and stuff and kind of take a break from the parenting life for a little bit. Was he born near the area he worked later on? Um, that's a good question. I mean, he ended up going back to his hometown and he was still able to work along that highway. I'm not exactly sure how close the highway was to where he grew up, but I would imagine that it's, you know, he's able to get on the highway. But I don't know too much about the geography in Oregon. So that's a that's a good question. I don't know that. 
Okay, so she goes out to this this rodeo, and later in the night, her and her husband got into an argument after he was wanting to go out and party more with a couple of friends. And she was like, no, like, I want to go home to my baby. Like, you know, we've been drinking a little bit, and all I want to do is just go home and, like, see our baby. And he, he wanted to keep partying. So then they kind of got into an org- argument over again. Again, they've been drinking and stuff. So, you know, pro- argument probably got a little bit more heated than it needed to be. And she even remembered saying, like, oh, the argument was just so stupid. But she gets so mad that she kind of storms off. She's like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going home. I'm going to go home to my baby. I don't want to be here right now. I need someone that can give me a ride out of here and take me home. If it's in Oregon, so yeah. Oh, yeah, it must be close-ish. close-ish. Um, that's what I'm imagining it would be. So, she ends up um, finding a guy to be able to take her home. I think one of her friends recommended him. She doesn't know him too well, but honestly, she's so tired, and all she wants to do is go home and see her baby, so she's willing to kind of get a ride from anybody at this point, especially since she's not able to, like, hitchhike or anything. She doesn't feel comfortable with hitchhiking, so she's like, yes, sign me up. He can take me home. And this guy is John Arthur Ackroyd. So she gets into his truck. He starts taking her over to her mother-in-law's house, which is where she said to drop her off. And after about an hour, um, she's already kind of fallen asleep in his truck. And all of a sudden, he kind of pulls off onto the side of the road. And... She was, st- and she didn't notice this right away because she was still sleeping in the truck. And all of a sudden, she's awoken by him dragging her out of the passenger side. And um, she wakes up when her head kind of hits the door on her way out. And she's like, oh no, I'm trapped. I can't get out of here. Like, I can't fight my way out of here right now. And he has a knife to her neck and basically tells her that she is going to do whatever he wants or whatever he tells her to do. He rips off her jeans, like literally rips them off, like they're unusable, Uh, rips off her underwear, tears her underwear, tears her boots. I think he slashes her boots with a knife or with the knife that he has. And I'm not going to go into detail into the next part. You guys kind of probably know what happens. Um, He proceeds to rape her and afterwards <laughs> sorry about that guys my husband's coming home so they're a little they're a little excited so afterwards he asks her well what do i do with you now and she's like you take me home that's what you do you take me home to my baby right now And she somehow convinces him not to kill her and to take her to her mother-in-law's house. And on the way, he's even asking her, like, oh, will you be my girlfriend? And just kind of all this fucked up stuff. And she... Okay, sorry. They might be doing that a couple times. It's really annoying. Um... So, yeah, on the way, he's just kind of, like, asking her all these questions, and she's just in fight-or-flight mode right now, and trying to just get away, trying to get away from him, or trying to do whatever she can to be able to survive this, because she's already, she already knows that she's on thin ice. I I think the dogs hate the name Ackroyd, too. Um, So she's just trying to do whatever she can to survive. So, you know, she answers yes to the questions of, oh, do you want to be my girlfriend? She says yes. She's like, whatever I can say to get out of here. So he drops her off. She runs to her mother-in-law's house, starts banging on the door, and her mother-in-law opens it. She sees that she's just tattered. She's wearing, like, these pants that Ackroyd had given her from the back of his truck. She has, like, grass in her hair. She just looks awful. And her mother-in-law's like, what happened? And she's like, call the police. I've just been raped. And her mother-in-law was trying to get her to take a shower to wash off 
all of his scent and all, just wash off all of his disgusting whatever. And this, <laughs> I dude, she says no. I want to hold this in for as long as I can because I want them to take the, his DNA. I want them, the police, to catch this fucker. And there's no way I'm just going to wash off all of this evidence. And I can't imagine how hard that was for her to make that decision. It's just, I can't even imagine what kind of stuff that she had to go through. So they immediately call the police. She goes to the hospital, has a rape kit done, and is finally able to take a shower after. And, you know, she provides her testimony to the police, tells them exactly what happens. And she is an Indian American, which shouldn't matter, but she definitely thinks that this kind of contributes to the fact of what the police response was to to this uh, rape charge, I guess, or this, this thing that happened to her. So she provides her testimony. Ackroyd is then later interviewed or interrogated about it. Um, and they're still kind of unsure, despite the evidence, despite the rape kit that was performed, they're still unsure about whether it happened or not. So they ask both of them to take a polygraph test. And this is kind of where things go wrong. Um, Marlene ends up failing the polygraph test and Ackroyd ends up passing the polygraph test. And Ackroyd's testimony was that she seduced him asked him to pull over on the side and they had sex or whatever. That was his claim. <sighs> it makes my blood boil. It's fucking... It's, ugh. Dude, I can't. And the thing is, is like polygraph tests aren't that reliable. Especially like there are serial killers out there and psychopaths that are able to pass a polygraph test even though they're lying because they're able to stay so calm and they're able to act like it actually happened. And I think that was kind of the case for Ackroyd. He was so calm and collected and didn't care about the situation. It was not nervous and he passed. Whereas Marlene, I mean, imagine what kind of anxiety she has about doing this i mean she reports it immediately after it happened which is already very brave for a, a rape victim and then she's getting criticized by the police she's asked to get to take a polygraph test which is already a nerve-wracking experience so you know i i feel like that's what happened and the police end up not moving further with the case because they didn't believe marlene they just said nope we're not gonna pursue this any further don't believe you and if they would have just believed her and would have moved forward with it prosecuted him anything then they could have potentially saved so many more lives it's a sad thing <sighs> sorry guys this story is a bummer today i it doesn't get any better i promise you those who don't know what a rape kit is, it's time to see if a person test positive. Yep, thank you, Prometheus, for just like a little background on that. Why well, take a polygraph in the first place? Dude, I know. I, it's like the evidence was all on her. How are you just not going to believe her? It's absolutely crazy. And she, the thing was, too, that I forgot to mention was that she had like bruises on her face or on her back. Um, she had, she was injured. It wasn't like, you know, she just had semen in her and they were able to take that. It was like, no, she had bruising and scratches on her. How is that not evidence enough to do something about it? They really, they could have saved so many victims and we're going to get into it. <sighs> Dude. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, too, in his claim about what happened was that she had torn her own pants when taking them off because they were torn. Uh, okay, they're jeans, okay? Like, if you're getting ready to have sex with somebody and you're consenting to that, no matter how excited you are, you're not gonna rip a pair of jeans 
that's just not gonna happen. Like, if I tried, I probably could not rip my jeans. Like, that is not happening. I'm actually surprised that he was able to rip them off of her. It's just, I don't understand how the police could, like, believe him over her. But it just baffles me. But anyways, let's go ahead and kind of move on to the next victim. I'm just going to kind of keep a trigger warning on the entire stream just for right now because it just doesn't get any better. So next, on December 24th, 1978, a woman named Kay Turner, she was 35 at the time, left her home in the early morning around 8 a.m. to go for a run along Camp Sherman Road. And she was planning on running for eight miles before returning home. And the thing about Kay is that she loved to run. She, in fact, that year she had just finished two half marathons. She had also climbed Mount Washington and Three Fingered Jack at some point during the year. Like, she was very athletic. Um, so yeah, she was planning on going for a run for about eight miles, you know, morning run, and then coming back home probably around 1030 or so. Uh, Kate Turner, or Kate Turner, I forgot. Oh, I, I said the name, uh, Kay Turner. K-A-Y-E, Kay Turner. Um, so a friend was actually supposed to go run with her as well, but this friend knows how athletic Kay is, and she's kind of intimidated by her, and she's, she ends up declining or backing out last minute because she's just like, oh, I don't know if I just feel comfortable. I feel like I'm not able to keep up with her. So she ends up going alone. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem, Prometheus. Going alone. And by the way, they, her and her husband were kind of vacationing out, kind of like a holiday vacation out on Camp Sherman. They had a cabin out there, it sounded like. Um, so yeah, they were just on a holiday vacation. We were planning on opening presents that night, uh, that night and the next day, because it was, it was Christmas Eve when this happened. Um, she was originally from Southern Oregon she, and was very close with her parents. And in fact, with her in her last visit with her parents, she had left a note to her dad saying, Hi, Dad. I love you, Kay. So she goes out for a run. And by 10 a.m., she's not home. And her husband, Noel, starts to get nervous because he's like, she should be home by now. So he starts driving around, kind of looking for her, doesn't see her immediately, because he probably knows the route that she takes to run, and he doesn't see her along that route. So then he calls the police, saying, my wife is missing. It is on the bottom of the story. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything about Camp Sherman. I don't know if it's like a cool spot to hang out or camp in or anything. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be on my my top of the list of places to go. But I mean, she's from Oregon. You know, it's probably, they just have a cabin out there, take a nice trip out there for a holiday vacation. I don't blame them. So, Ackroyd was originally investigated because he had been seen in the general area around the time of her disappearance. He told investigators that he was working in Santium Junction, which was roughly 25 miles away from Camp Sherman. He also said that he got off work around 6.30 that morning and had driven through the camp just looking for coyotes, as one does. I mean, he was known to be kind of an avid hunter. He liked to hunt, hunt deer and hunt all kinds of things. I don't know, he's a hunter. So he's probably trying to go out, look for coyotes, and he had claimed at this time that he had seen a runner uh, pass by him as he was driving on the road. And that was kind of all the details that he gave police at that time. So the thing is, is they didn't really fixate on Ackroyd at first, only because they had no reason to at that point. They didn't have a body yet. His only testimony was that he had seen a runner and they had no really any reason to be able to suspect him. So they start looking at the husbands at Noel because usually 
nine times out of ten it's the husband that does it so they really investigated him at first and found out that he didn't do it they looked into her past and her history a little bit more and found out that she was actually having two extramarital affairs and you know they have to kind of look into every lead that they have and so they looked into those relationships and found out that you know none of the guys there had anything to do or had no reason to want to hurt Kay in any way so it kind of went a little cold for a bit because they didn't have anything to go on so on December 26 1978 just a couple days later a couple trackers found two pairs of frozen footprints in a clearing near where Ackroyd had claimed he saw Kay one of the sets were from the shoes that Kay was said to be wearing that morning, and the other set were, they seemed to appear to be from a very large man. And these footprints indicated that there was a scuffle and that the larger man had eventually won the scuffle and was able to drag the other person away. I mean, assuming it's Kay. They did all this when they should have started searching for her body. I think they did start searching for her body kind of while they were investigating. Like, there were search parties and stuff uh, trying to look for her. Unless I'm thinking of Richanda. Um, but I think they were trying to search for Kay as well. And they just ha weren't able to find her. I mean, Highway 20, and even in, like, around Camp Sherman, it's a very heavily, like, wooded area. So... Even in a search party isn't really probably going to produce any results because it's so vast and so huge that it's going to be very difficult to find any bodies. So, um, so yeah, they didn't find any bodies initially. But they did find these footprints. And um, despite the findings of the footprints, um, the police didn't really find them accurate and just dismissed it completely. They're like, oh, this has nothing to do with our case, so whatever. Burgundy. Oh, shit. Uh, I think my thing is over here. <laughs> Give me one second. Okay. My apologies. Burgundy. I don't even know what a burgundy looks like. We'll do that. Um, okay, so yeah, the police just dismissed the footprints completely. So nothing happened. No new leads came about. They didn't even find a body for eight months. After eight months, Ackroyd comes um, forward and announces that he has found Kay's remains in nearby woods. He, um, he said he was headed to Camp Sherman to hunt rabbits with his dog, even though the area was unusual choice for hunting rabbits, but people were like, okay, kind of weird. Um, and he had like gone to a storekeeper named Christine Weston about his discovery and that he felt that he was in trouble because he was the last person to have seen her alive and the fact that he's like reporting this so it was kind of suspicious and she's like yeah you're right it is suspicious and weston responded by having her husband alert the authorities about Ackroyd's statements so now the police are getting involved the man's red there you go i found kate dirty yeah not suspicious at all especially if you're the last person to see her and like he's a really bad serial killer <laughs> like just he does so many weird things throughout this whole case that it's like what are you doing like you, you're almost trying to get caught and it's crazy that like he wasn't caught sooner so he then leads them to bits of cloth and bone that the they he had found and the investigators thought it was a little weird because he was known to be a very avid hunter like i said before and you know as a hunter as you're going through the woods, you're going to find a bunch of pieces of cloth and bones, like animal bones and stuff. So 
it seems weird to authorities that he sees this piece of cloth and bone and immediately links it to Kay. They're like, oh, why would you immediately, why would your thoughts immediately go to this versus just, oh, this cloth is, you know, just from someone else or this bone is like some animal bones. Like, they just thought that was a little weird. Dude, I know. It's like, oh my God, how are you? like hold him in custody I don't know they interrogated him for a long time too I was going to show some police interviews but it was like two hours long and I couldn't find a good clip that I wanted to show but yeah dude dude so they searched that area for a week and they found more and more of Kay's body they found her lower jawbone and some yellow shorts that she was wearing that day they found one sneaker that was intact and the heel of another sneaker. They also found her blue pullover and her underwear. And lastly, they found her Timex watch that had stopped at 9.27 a.m. on December 24th, which, um, you know, the struggle that had ensued on that day most likely knocked out the pin that was in the watch and it stopped exactly at 9.27 a.m. which is really eerie probably get copyrighted over a police interview you think I've shown interviews before so I don't think I would but maybe I know it's cre I always like when I hear of cases where like the time stops at that it's just like just sends shivers down my spine it's so creepy so Another thing, too, is while they were searching for her body and kind of collecting this evidence, there was one police officer that was kind of having a break at a, on a tree stump, having some lunch while, you know, they're searching for her body. And he happens to look up at a bird's nest and he's like, oh, that's kind of a weird bird's nest. And he looks a little closer and he finds blonde hair woven in the nest. And the birds had used Kay's hair as a bird's nest so they took that into evidence too like maybe it was Kay trying to tell that this is when it happens uh could be or the the struggle also knocked the pin out so the time stopped because of that i don't think it was Kay trying to tell them what happened but it definitely could be it would come under fair use she's providing commentary as well there you go there you go. So police interrogated Ackroyd, understandably, and he changed his story from when he was initially interviewed back in December when this all happened. And so he changes his story. He says also that he first discovered Kay and her remains in February of 1979. And he was actually really gruesome in describing her body and what he had found which I'm not going to go into detail at all because you guys don't need to hear that. Um, you're welcome to go listen to the interview if you want, but um, very gruesome details. And he also claimed that he hadn't reported it at the time because he was afraid of being accused of killing her, and it's like, yeah, no shit. Then why are you coming forward eight, later, eight months later and telling this story? Like, doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Why would you do that? <sighs> Um, but yeah, he changed his initial story as well, claiming that he not only saw a runner, which is what he originally said, like, oh, I just saw a runner, you know, as I was passing, but no, that he saw a runner with Kay's description and actually pulled over and stopped to speak with her. I don't know what about, um, but yeah, that he's actually pulled over and spoke with her and he was the last person to talk to her and just admitted that. It's like, he's like giving them uh, he's giving it to them you know so he um and he also mentioned that on the morning of Kay's disappearance he was with his hunting buddy Roger Dale Beck and we'll talk about him a little bit later but uh they initially claimed to be hunting coyotes but then it later changed that they were going to poach deer so like both of their stories are changing and it's looking really sus no I know I'm saying maybe her spirit or something Oh, you're trying to make it creepy? I gotcha, I gotcha. 
Yeah, he confessed when he failed the simple question. Did you touch K? Yeah, I know. It's like, it's so weird, dude. Um, but yeah, and people later speculate that, you know, because everyone thinks that he killed K, that he went back in February to go and make sure that her remains hadn't been found or that she was still there. And they say that this is usual for serial killers to want to go back to the site of where it happens as kind of like a nostalgic thing and they're able to kind of reignite feelings that they had at the time of the attack is really weird um so they think that's kind of what he was doing dude he is he's he is sussy baka i don't know what it means but he is so despite the circumstantial evidence they didn't have enough to be able to charge him because I don't think they knew what the cause of death was at that time until they later confessed. But they didn't just they just didn't have enough. It was all circumstantial evidence and they didn't want to risk taking it to trial and not having him get convicted for it. But at the same time, he's out here free, able to hurt other people. So who knows? The case case soon went cold after that. Yes, definitely sus. To relive the event for gratification purposes, I believe. Yep, that's exactly right, devil. Um, exactly right. So, okay, so nothing really happens until like the mid-1980s. He marries a woman named Linda Pickle and uh, lives in Santium Junction. Their relationship is kind of more an arrangement than it is really love-based because she, Linda, had um, a history of like abusive and cheating boyfriends and didn't really have a stable life. And she had two kids uh, named Richanda and Byron. Uh, Byron's older. And she really wanted to have that stability for her children. So she decides to live with Ackroyd. They get married. And she just kind of wants this stable environment for them. And she loved being able to have a place to stay and know that she could stay there. However, it would quickly go downhill for the whole family. So let's kind of talk about Richanda a little bit. So she, she was the daughter of Linda and she was um, Ackroyd stepdaughter. She was known as a really good kid who like helped her mom around the house and you know was just kind of starting to live her life as a teenager. Around the, the time that we're talking about she was 13 years old and this is her and her family would often call her Channy and she was known to love like pop music. Uh, she wasn't super popular at school but she loved to just she was definitely a homebody and you know, loved to help her mom, and it was just, she was just a really good kid. Really good kid. Which makes this so sad. So, very quickly, Ackroyd was known to be abusive towards Richanda. Her friends would see her come to school with a black eye, and an, there was one time when she came to school with like an open spot on her head and her hair wasn't done and her friends were kind of like teasing her like, oh, what happened? Or, you know, like, oh, why isn't your hair done kind of thing? And she was like, um, my stepdad did this. He pulled my hair out and they were like, oh shit, um, that's, that's not okay. And her friends at the time too had also admitted to being sexually abused at home. So they were kind of, they really were drawn to kind of Richanda to kind of help her out in this scenario. And Richanda later admitted to them that she was also getting sexually abused by Ackroyd. Hydrate. I know, this picture makes me so sad for her. It just really seemed like she just, she had her whole life ahead of her and so sad. I think you guys can kind of see where I'm going with this story. So, um, and her brother Byron also recounted that they would have regular beatings by Ackroyd and Richanna would often be really sad when school was over because that meant she had to go back to Ackroyd. Um, 
she would always be like, oh, no, like, I have two hours left of school. Oh, there's only one hour left of school. She would beg her friends to let her stay the night over at their place and would pretty much have an anxiety attack, even though that's what it wasn't what it was called at the time. If But she had an anxiety attack if she had to go home because she didn't want to go home. And it was just all, just all awful. So... Only after a year of marriage did Ackroyd and Linda Pickle divorce. However, they continued to live together along with, you know, Linda's children because uh, they wanted that arrangement or Linda wanted that arrangement so they could have a stable home. Although she didn't know what was going on. She knew that Ackroyd beat them, I think, but she didn't know truly what was going on. This place is home if one does not wish to return back there. I know. I know. It's it's really sad when you feel like you can't go home. It's just awful. So, on July 10th, 1990, Rich Handa disappears. Um, the morning of, both Linda and Ackroyd had left for work and weren't expected to be back until the afternoon. And Rich Handa was supposed to do a few chores that day that her mother had left out for her, like vacuuming or mopping, doing the dishes, you know, just kind of stuff for her to do around the house. So Ackroyd had dropped Linda off at her job at the resort and headed toward the state maintenance shop in Bend to, you know, start his day. And he claims that he decided to just take the day off after learning that parts hadn't arrived for this snow plow that he was kind of working on. So he was just like, oh, nothing for me to do. I'm just going to go home. And his supervisor was baffled by this because he's like, there's plenty of work for you to do. Why are you just kind of leaving? So he thought that was weird because it wasn't like he didn't have nothing to do. But he just decided to take the day off. So, he then returns home and claims that he finds Rich Hannah on the couch just watching TV. Um, and then that's where he invites her to go to, <laughs> to go photograph wildlife that morning. He was like, hey, let's go and take pictures of wildlife. And of course, you know, she's going to say no, whether or not that actually happened. <laughs> She said no, and so he kind of went by himself, supposedly. And of course she's not going to go with him. That's her abuser. She's not going to choose to go with him, unless she's under some kind of duress. But she's not going to willingly go with him, you know? Um, and she declined, supposedly, because she had those chores left to do in the house, and she wanted to be able to do them. I want to go down to hell just to punch this son of a bitch. Dude, same here. This guy truly is a piece of shit. Truly. So, so then he goes out and goes alone. He returns a few hours later and finds her just gone. Doesn't think too much of it. He doesn't even really seem worried. He doesn't try to find her. He's just like, oh, she's gone. And then he goes and picks up Linda from work. So, um, Richanda was still missing when Ackroyd and Linda came home. And Linda was worried because this wasn't like Richanda. Richanda normally, if she was leaving to go to the neighbor's or go to a friend's house, she would leave a note for her mom so she wouldn't be worried about her. But there was no note this time. And Richanda was gone. And when Linda looked in Richanda's room, her makeup, brush, and stuff were still in her room. Her nightgown was on the floor. And she was like, those are items that she would normally, like, take with her. And they're just not there. They're still there. So it's like, where did she go? And I normally wouldn't talk about this next part because it doesn't seem important. But for this case, it is. Ackroyd then initiates sex with Linda that night while Richand is missing. And this is notable because Ackroyd was known not to really have a sex appetite, if you want to call it. Like, they didn't have sex often. But all of a sudden, that day, he goes, I want to have sex. Like, 
right now. And they do. So they think later that this was kind of like he's excited about Richanda missing or if, and you know, he did do something to her that this was him getting it out. You know, it's just gross. Uh, it's just gross. Ugh. <sighs> and he also told Win Linda to wait until the next day to call police. And she was just like, okay. Because she thought, or he told her, like, oh, you have to wait 24 hours until you report her missing. And sure enough, she calls police the next day. And they're like, why in the hell did you not report this last night? To which she's like, oh, because I had to wait 24 hours to be able to report someone. And they're like, no, not for, not for children. Children, you report it right away. And she's like, oh whoops so um yeah so then they go and try to find richanda search parties were called but they couldn't find richanda and linda was asking actually you know what where is she what happened to her you were the last person to see her you should know where she is and he doesn't have an answer Colossal cunty cunt. I know. I'm sorry, devil. This one's an awful one today. Try to warn ya. It's actually the worst. Um, we're just like halfway through. It's awful. So, police were already skeptical of Ackroyd after the Kay Turner case, and they were pretty convinced that he had something to do with Richanda's disappearance as well. And they were also really skeptical of the fact that he didn't seem affected by her disappearance at all. In fact, the way he talked about her, he almost sexualized her to police. Like, he was like, oh, I would imagine that, you know, if a guy kind of came into the house and saw Richanda and saw that she was, like, blossoming and blooming and becoming a woman and, like, it just, it's stuff like that, that just makes you go, she's 13. She is your stepdaughter. You should not be talking about her like that, especially to investigators. Like, it's just gross. So, you know, he was saying that kind of stuff, too, about her. And investigators are going, what the hell is this guy doing? So, police knew that Ackroyd had made Richanda disappear. They just knew it in their gut. They didn't need evidence to know this guy is fishy, this guy had something to do with it, but they were ne never able to find her body and therefore they couldn't have, they didn't have anything, anything to prove that he had something to do with her disappearance, so they didn't prosecute him for it because of that. But what they did decide to do is turn back to the Kay Turner case because they had found a body there and they can prosecute for it, so they were working really hard to prosecute him for the Kay Turner case and at least have some form of justice. So investigators, and again, the Kay Turner case happened in 78, so new investigators are going into old police files, old news reports, and finding anything that they can that could lead them to prosecuting Ackroyd. And they found out and remembered that Ackroyd had said he had been out with an old hunting buddy on the day of Kay's disappearance, and his name is Roger Dale Beck. So I know this kind of gives some stuff away, but this was the only picture I could find of him. However, this kind of gives a major breakthrough in this case because police then know to contact his ex-wife, who was his wife at the time, of Kay's disappearance and now ex-wife. So they go and interview her and she says, hey, look, I lied about everything. I was told to say that these men went out hunting and I was told to say where they were and I was threatened that I would die or I would suffer the same fate as Kay if I had mentioned anything about where they actually were. Because, and here's what she says. She says that Ackroyd had arrived to pick up Beck to go poach deer on the morning of Kay's disappearance. 
And she goes on to say that they didn't return until the next day and that their clothes were covered in blood. In fact, she said she had to throw away Beck's shirt and jeans because the blood stains were so bad. And that's when Beck had told her that Kay was raped and then shot. And that's when he said, if you say anything about it, you're going to suffer the same fate. And so she lied for them. And now she, you know, she's telling them about all of this. So, while they're kind of investigating this case and trying to pin anything that they can on Ackroyd, Ackroyd ends up leaving um, the house and is no longer living with Linda. And this is in early 1992 by this point. And he goes back to move in with his mother, especially since women in the area now, kind of knowing and suspecting Ackroyd of committing these awful acts. They were just uncomfortable with his presence there. So he decides to move back in with his mother in, I believe, Sweet Home, Oregon. And at this point, he was also working out of Corvallis and he was transferred out of Santiam Junction. And they said that this made it worse because he was able to be supervised at least somewhat in Santiam Junction. But now that he's moving to Corvallis, he doesn't really have as much supervision. He's kind of on his own. So he's able to, no one really keeps track of him. So it's just great. So now we're going into our next victims. In the spring of 1992, two women named Melissa Sanders, who was 17 at the time, and Sheila Swanson, who was 19 at the time, were looking for a ride after they were going camping with Melissa's family in Beverly Beach State Park. And they had decided that they were over the camping trip and just wanted to leave. So they kind of left a little early and were trying to find a ride out of there. And they didn't tell their family that they were leaving. They just went because these two women, they kind of like to live on the adventurous side, on the dangerous side a little bit. Um, They had met six months prior to this camping trip and they had their own kind of history with drugs and alcohol. They just liked to party and they were kind of unpredictable and teenagers just kind of living life how they see fit or saw fit. So they call their boyfriends to say, hey, can you guys come pick us up and we can hang out, whatever. And their boyfriend said, no, like, we're not going to go pick, you know, drive to go pick you up at a campground. So they're like, "Okay, no worries. We'll just hitchhike because, you know, that's safe, right? And I'm sure their boyfriends now are probably kicking themselves that they didn't just go and drive and pick them up. So they agreed to hitchhike. And the thing about them too is that they were known to frequent this restaurant. I think it was called Sherry's Restaurant in Sweet Home. And this is where they became acquainted with a man named John Arthur Ackroyd. And whenever they would enter the restaurant, people would, witnesses claimed that he would go to them immediately. It was almost very stockish the way he wanted to talk to them and hang out with them. So they already thought that was really weird. So on the day, and I don't know exactly what day, I just know it's in the spring of 1992, these girls disappeared. Melissa's family woke up to the two teenagers missing from the campgrounds, and when they returned home from the camping trip, they found that both Melissa and Sheila Sheila hadn't returned home. Uh, On the same day, or around the same time, a few co-workers of Ackroyd's noticed that his truck was still in the parking lot when they arrived for their graveyard shift, which was really, really unusual because he doesn't normally work that late at night. So, soon after they had arrived for their graveyard shift, and we're just kind of noting how it was weird that he was staying so late, Ackroyd pulls up in his rig, and the weird part is, is he is covered in dried blood. And his coworkers are like, what in the fuck happened to you? 
and he's just like, oh, I ran into a deer on the way here. It was roadkill, so I decided to gut him and threw his carcass in the bushes, and yeah, now I'm here. And they were like, what the fuck? What it kind of story is that? You run into a deer, and then you decide to gut them while you're there, and they just think the whole story is just off. But they don't question it at the time. You know, they're just like, okay, classic, accurate, I guess, whatever. They don't think much of it because they don't know anything has happened yet. So he washes up and drives home. So nothing really happens in the case of Melissa and Sheila until their bodies were found in the fall of 1992 by a few hunters in the area along Route 20. Uh, they found Sheila's ankles were bound by leggings and trigger warning. Melissa's body was found nude with parts of her missing, most likely due to animals, you know, dragging her body away. Again, this is the woods. And nearby, they found a rivet, which had possibly fallen out of the perpetrator's pocket during the attack. And you know, a rivet is a mechanics tool. Accurate is a mechanic. So, you know, kind of sketchy. So, the medical examiner, you know, does an autopsy, and the state of the bodies makes it, makes it really difficult to identify a cause of death because, I mean, they have been in the woods for months at this point. So, but the medical examiner most like, says it's most likely due to strangulation. That's kind of what he was speculating. So when it was reported that these women were found, Ackroyd's coworker remembers, oh yeah, they, went, they probably went missing around the time that I saw this weird thing that happened with Ackroyd with his hands covered in blood coming in to, coming back from work. So he reports that to the police like, hey, this is weird, this is what I found, it could be in relation to these cases. And just a few weeks later, before police can really talk to Ackroyd about this case, they arrest him for the murder of Kay Turner. There's this, this lovely face. <laughs> oh, God. I don't even want to say that. I can't even say it sarcastically. I hate this guy. I know. Rest in peace. Poor babies. See, if they had only listened to Marlene, they, they wouldn't. this wouldn't have happened. It just... This case is so aggravating and so heartbreaking. So, you know, while he's like arrested, they also want to interview him for the two murders that they just found. But this time, Ackroyd is smart enough to lawyer up and stay silent about it. Doesn't talk about it. They don't interview him at all. Because um, they have no reason to hold him or to interrogate him you know, about this case or anything, because they don't really have anything linking him. They just want to talk to him. So he stays silent on it. They pursue other leads with these two women, especially since they kind of live dangerous lives. Um, you know, they followed those leads, but none of them really led anywhere. And unfortunately, their case goes cold. Um, there was a couple investigators in 2012 that picked up the woman's case and tried to find other links to Ackroyd, and I think they did a pretty good job, but they still just weren't able to prosecute him for any of it, and so their families, unfortunately, um, don't get justice for, for their murders, and it sucks. It sucks. However, in late 1993, Ackroyd was taken to trial for the murder of Kay Turner, finally. And during the trial, uh, a young woman came forward as a witness to the crime and said that she was also running along Camp Sherman on the same day that Turner was. And uh, I think she said that, um, let me see. Sorry, I'm trying to look. Um, so I think what happened was she saw Kay with like a, a strange man or, or something, but she didn't think anything of it and she didn't see anything that was weird, so she didn't really report it at the time. 
um, didn't really think anything of it. However, what's weird about her is that she had also run into Aykroyd previously, and her name is Jane Morris. And I apologize, I don't have a picture of her. Um, but yeah, she ran into Aykroyd previously. Hydrate. Um, so Jane was riding her bike home after waitressing and noticed Aykroyd standing near his truck that was parked alongside the road in Camp Sherman. And she's riding her bike along and she points a handgun, or sorry, he points a handgun at her and orders her to stop. And this badass bitch, she drops down on her handlebars, starts pedaling as fast as she can, weaves back and forth so she's a harder target to hit, but he doesn't even end up shooting her. He just lets her go and she just keeps going. So she didn't really think anything of that day. I think she reported it to police, but they couldn't, you know, follow any leads or anything. But she just remembers his face. And it wasn't until he was taken to Kay Turner's trial that she realizes, oh my God, that's the guy that tried to shoot me. And like, I can't believe that someone else fell victim to him. I can't believe I got away. So she tells the story on the stands. And, you know, trial commences you know, trial stuff happens, and then he was eventually charged and found guilty for her murder and sentenced to life in Oregon State Penitentiary after the jury deliberates for four hours. And his counterpart, his little hunting buddy, was also found guilty in a separate trial and also sentenced to life in prison. However, he is still open to parole. Sorry, I should say Aykroyd is still open for parole after, you know, several years. And neither of them confessed to the crime. They never said, they always said they were innocent, which it's like, yeah, that's bullshit. Okay, keep living in your fantasy land. So nothing really happens until like 2013 when prosecutors want to prevent him from ever getting out of prison, from getting parole or pursuing parole, anything like that. So they go after him for Rich Handa's disappearance again, saying, you know, there's enough time has passed. We know she's dead by now, even though there's no body. We think we have enough to be able to, to get him for this too. And at least one more family can have justice or feel like they have justice. And her brother Byron was the only family member that went to her trial and represented her. And it was so emotional. Like I was watching the documentary, again, Ghost of Highway 20. Please go check it out. Oh, I was watching this documentary. My heart broke for her brother because you could tell he just... Mm, that trial really kind of did a number on him. But he was like, I want to be here and I want to see her get justice. And I never want to see that motherfucker get out of prison. So he went and represented her. And he ended up pleading no contest. And, you know was uh, found guilty for it, I believe, um, even though he pleaded no contest. So pleading no contest just means he neither c confesses to it, but he also doesn't deny it either, which is kind of weird, but he agrees to not go after parole. That was basically the agreement there. I know, it's sad that they never found Chanda's body. And, you know, by now, just with, you know, animals in the area and weather, I don't know if she'll ever be found. I mean, the woods over there are so huge that it's very unlikely that anyone's gonna find her. And it's so sad. She deserves that, her family deserves that. That's just so, that's unfortunate. So, it's also believed that he's involved in the murders of several other women as well. Um, you know, people that went missing in the area, all along that highway, really, because that was kind of, his highway. He knew it so well after working there for several years. He know how trafficked it is. He knows just the ins and outs of it. So they suspect that he could have murdered several other people, but they just don't know because they don't have that information. And they can't really pursue him for any other cases because he dies on December 30th, 2016 from heart disease. And this is this motherfucker, what he looks like, older. 
Workers like that need to be run. Dang, devil. I mean, I'm, you're not wrong. It's very descriptive. <laughs> but hey, you are not wrong. Not wrong at all. Um, but with that said, that's today's story. Thank you so much for watching, and if you like what you saw, make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if you want to watch Sinister Sundays live, make sure to tune in at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Sunday at twitch.tv slash behind blue eyes underscore for the next story. Okay, thanks. Bye!